Hey folks, Brendan here from Blue Light, back with you to support you on your journey as you go through the police recruitment process or today as you go for promotion once you're actually in the police. Because I'm going to take a look at a, um, a question for you here. Have we got it right? When it comes to our role as public servants, was that what Sir Robert Peel intended back in 1829? Or did he have something else in mind? So in today's podcast, in today's video, I'm going to talk to you about something that you'll find useful in your online assessment centre when it comes to the stage three written, the stage three briefing, because people are getting 90 plus percent when they use this sort of model, this sort of frame of mind for policing. If you're going for promotion boards and you've got forward facing questions where you're going to be asked questions about how you're going to include um, diversity, equality and inclusion in everything that you do or how you're going to engage with the communities in the future. And in your final interviews, I know there's forces out there that ask you questions about problem solving and ask you questions about community engagement. So there's, there's something in today's podcast and video for everyone. Now, it's going to be a little bit longer than normal as I'm dealing with a, an issue that's quite complex. And it's one that I'm quite passionate about as well because of my history as a neighbourhood inspector. I spent eight years as a neighbourhood inspector pioneering some approaches to problem solving which were less about focusing on the deficits in the community and more about focusing on the assets in the community. Asset-based community development, appreciative inquiry, all sorts of names and labels that we applied to the methodology and we did a lot of amazing things, we got some amazing results. I went on to do work with the European Union, I've spoken at conferences, I've worked with police forces since then. So this isn't just based on Brendan's wacky ideas, it's based on a lot of research. And if you'd like to find out what that research is, what underpins these ideas, then please do drop me a line. If you'd like to join the courses that enable you to pass your promotion boards, your online assessment centre, your final interviews, then all the links are below. So anyway, back to the question, should we be seen as public servants or should we be view ourselves as citizen enablers? So let me start right back in 1829 with Sir Robert Peel, because you've all heard the phrase, haven't you? The police should remember the historic tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police. I know you're all sat there saying, yeah, I know that, Brendan. We hear that every day on the television and the news. We hear our chiefs talking about that. We see it on Twitter all the time. But how many of you, go on, own up to this. How many of you as serving police officers, especially, know the line that comes next as part of that principle? Go on, just cast your mind back. Do you know what comes next? No? Right, it's this. The police should remember the historic tradition. So it's historic back in 1829, that the police are the public and the public are the police. The police just being members of the public who are paid full time to carry out a role which is incumbent on all citizens in the interests of community welfare and existence. So there he talks about how the police are the public, the public are the police. Yeah, we get that bit. But actually, the police, you're just members of the public. You're just paid full time to carry a role which is actually incumbent on all citizens in the interests of community welfare and existence. You could have said in the interest of reducing crime, you could have said in the interest of community safety, but he didn't. He said in the interest of community welfare and existence. So I think that there's something about this here, that if we consider communities that are really cohesive, where there's lots of associational life, where there's lots of connections within the communities, where the community appears to be healthy, vibrant, then they tend to be the communities where there is less crime. They tend to be the communities where there's less social problems, where, there's, where people live longer, generally, where people have better educational attainment. And I know some of you are going to say, oh, that's just down to money, that's just down to wealth. No, I don't think it is. Not entirely. I think that's part of the picture, but I don't think it's entirely the picture. I think there's a lot to do with the welfare and existence of the community. And I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to go bold here and say that actually, in our approach of being public servants, I think we've harmed communities. In my experience, we have done harm to communities because we've tried to fix them. Now, where's the evidence for that? Well, I can go to any police force website and I will pretty much guarantee, no, I'm gonna guarantee it actually, that in that website or on their Twitter feed or somewhere on one of their Facebook pages, I'm going to find the police 
asking communities to come forward and share their concerns and priorities. Come and tell us what the come and tell us what the problems are. Come and share your concerns and priorities. So I played this one out with one of my clients on a one-to-one -one, uh, this week, someone who's going for the online assessment centre, because I wanted to get ahead in the space of answering the questions for the stage three written and the stage three briefing from a mindset of citizen enabler as opposed to mindset of public servant. And you might be thinking, God, Brendan, you're playing with people's scores at the online assessment centre. No, I'm not, because over the past two years, everyone who's used this mindset gets 90 plus percent in their stage three. It works because it ticks all the boxes in the behaviours of the competency and values framework. I know that because I've mapped it out and it works because I'm a practitioner of this methodology of problem solving. So where this could be useful for you as a, on your board is if you're asked questions about how will you improve relationships with the community. Hey, that's especially topical in London at the moment. So there's a lot in here for you, but it's very long term. That's the thing. You know, it, this is a sort of three to five year process, not the problem solving the police normally engage with three hours or three days. This is three to five years or more. So it needs commitment from you as well to the community. So anyway, I, I asked uh, this client, I'm not going to say where she lives. I'm just, I just, she, I just asked her, just describe your environment. If we had one of those meetings where you come to the police and you tell the police what the problems and priorities are, what would you say in your area? And what she said was young people in antisocial behavior. I asked a little bit more about what that involves. And she said, young people getting drunk, especially at the weekends, young people and adults taking drugs out on the streets, homelessness, and uh, the place is a state. There's graffiti everywhere, street art everywhere. They call it street art, but it's just graffiti and it's just everywhere. And um, damaged parks, uh, damaged play areas, things just not generally being taken care of. Now, nothing unusual there. I could go to any city in any part of the country or any large town, and I guarantee I will find a place like that. I absolutely, I put money on it. A thousand pounds to charity of your choice. I will find a place like that. Even in sunny York, where we live, I know there are places where it looks a bit of a state, um, but not perhaps as much as what this client was describing. I think we're quite fortunate living in York. It's a very cohesive community. It's lots of associational life. There's lots of things for young people to do. There's lots of things for you to get involved in. It's got the lowest crime rate in North Yorkshire. North Yorkshire has the lowest crime rate in the whole of the country. Hmm. Is there something there? <laughs> is, is, is this getting your creative thinking going? Anyway, back to the question, public servant versus citizen enabler. So my client asked me, I asked the client, pretend you remember the public community meeting, what the problems and priorities, she listed those things. Now the next question is, uh, next question I asked her was, do you think it's a reasonable expectation that once you've told me about those things, that the police and partners would actually go away and deal with them? She said, yeah, I just told you, you asked for a problems and priorities. I've told you what they are. My expectation now is that you go and do something about it. And that's the blurb on most websites as well. They'll talk about how uh, working collaboratively with partners, they will um, take action to resolve and remedy those issues and they'll come back to you the next month. It's, the, it's what predicates the sort of you said we did way of policing. Except we're not business. You know, you said we did if you're a big supermarket. Yeah, great, but we're not a business. The police are not a business. I'm not quite sure whether that you said we did is a, is a great cultural norm to have in terms of your problem solving. Because we've just seen how by asking what the problems and priorities are, we've actually just increased the amount of demand on us because now there's an expectation that we're going to do something about those things. Here's something else for you as well to think about. If I walked around that area, I know the area concerned, but I'm not going to embarrass it. If I walked around that area without my client telling me these what, these what the problems are, within a few hours, I would work out that young people in antisocial behavior people getting drunk at the weekends, drugs, homelessness, graffiti, and parks and such like being a right state. I would work out within a couple of hours that those are big issues in that town stroke city. I put money on that. So why do you actually need a public meeting to be told about those things? And what if we're asking the wrong type of question? 
So from there, we started looking at, would, would it be possible, would it be beyond the realms of possibility for community groups who are actually out there now, these exist, but are we enabling them to be the best version of themselves they can be? Are we doing what we can to enable these communities, the individuals within these communities, and especially the communities, to be the best versions of themselves they can be? Bear with me, hopefully this will make sense. So the next stage, whoops, sorry, someone's just trying to call me. So the next stage would be, um, as opposed to asking the questions, what are the problems, and then saying, right, we'll go away and deal with them. The next stage would be, okay, let's bear those problems in mind, but then also let's take a look at what is currently working well in this community. So in terms of homelessness, what provision exists already? And you're probably going to find in most cities that there are small charities, small community groups who are helping to support the homeless. Young people and antisocial behaviour. It's not the beyond the realms of possibility, is it, for the community to actually establish meaningful activities for young people to get engaged in. I know that because give me an hour or two in any city or town, I will find community groups that are doing that now. But they're small and they need nurturing and they're growing and they need enabling more. In terms of drugs, same thing. I will find small charities, small community groups that are helping to support people who've got drug addiction issues. In terms of parks and such like being in the right state, I think there's a difference between ownership, parks and open spaces which are owned by, run by the council, tend not to get looked after. Whereas if it's a community association who's got responsibility for that open space, for that park, they tend to get looked after. I don't know if there's research on this, but it's just my observation over the years. It's my observation where I live here. It's my observation where I used to live. It's my observation in the places I've worked in. One of the places I worked in in Trafford, as an example, uh, Sale Moor. Um, a lot of the public spaces had broken glass, bins that had been burnt out. Um, it was a bit of a state. And the community association there, Sale Moor Community Association, decided that at the front of the association building, in an open space, they were going to build a community garden. And everyone said, no, it'll just get damaged, people will, it will smash it up, all the plants will get destroyed. Did that happen? No. Why? Because it was owned by and run by the community. It was their idea. So there's something about ownership here. So is it beyond the realms of possibility that community associations, voluntary groups, run open spaces? They do that in York. The biggest park in York is called Roundtree Park. It's got a community library. It's got a community cafe. It's got so many activities for people of all ages. It's got tennis courts, it's got a basketball court, it's got a skateboard park, it's got a huge park for young children, outdoor table tennis, a woodland area, a pond area, a football pitch, a big pond, it's just beautiful. There's so much going on. Yeah, it was left to the people of York by the Roundtree family, yes, the chocolate people, but it is managed entirely by volunteers in the community. I don't have any open space in York that is not run by and managed by members of the community. So if it's possible here in York, why is it not possible elsewhere? And they're fairly pristine because they're looked after and managed by the community as opposed to the council. So if all of those things are possible, as opposed to trying to fix all of those issues, what if we could enable the community, even if those little charities didn't exist, if we found people who demonstrate what I call the four C's, people who are capable, connected, they care enough to act and they'll commit to take action, and those people exist in communities. Again, challenge, give me two hours in any city, in any part of the country, and I will find 10 people, 10 people guaranteed with their telephone numbers who are capable, connected, they care enough to act and they'll commit to take action. People who are not currently volunteering as citizens in their community at this moment in time. I guarantee it, £1,000 to charity of your choice. If I don't find 10, I'll give £1,000 £1, Sorry, £1,000 to charity of your choice. If I do find 10, you owe me nothing. How about that as a challenge? Because they are there. I've done this. When I've gone and done work with councils and communities in places like Leeds, in 
places like um, in, in Nottinghamshire, Mansfield and in Oxford. I found those members of the community, they do exist. It's our job as the police to enable them, not to harm the community by fixing them all the time. Let's move away from this client dependent relationship to one that is more about enabling citizens to do the things that they're more than capable of doing if we give them the space to do so. If we give them the permission to do so, and actually we don't really need to give them permission, do we? You know, in the community groups that I helped enable with my fellow colleagues in the council and as an urban inspector, they'd sometimes come to me and say, um, can we do those things? And I'd say, well, can you? <laughs> Is there anything stopping you? Are you breaking the law? No. Well, go and do them then. Go and do those things. And so we want to pay close attention to um, our frame of mind when we're problem solving, our frame of mind when we're doing community engagement. Are we acting as citizen enablers or are we acting as public servants? I think the whole idea about being a public servant, might we might have got it wrong. It might be time to take a fresh look at our mindset in terms of how we enable communities. And so all of those things that my client described, they're all things that we're capable of fixing, but we need a working group to do that. So the working group needs establishing by the police because members of the community won't, might not necessarily do this off their own bat because they're not used to doing this because they've been so used to, we've got a problem, we'll call the police, call housing, call council, whoever it might be, and they'll come and fix it for us. So we need to form a working group. And in my webinars, I talk about how you go about doing that. Uh, there's, there's several things you can do to develop and grow your working group so that it includes members of the public, citizens, as Sir Robert Peel called them. It includes citizens and it includes citizens who are capable, connected, they care enough to act and they're committed to take action. And once we've got them in that working group, it's the nature of the questions we ask them that determine the direction we go in. So if we ask good old fashioned, we want to fix you, type questions, then what we're going to get as a result of that is them telling us what all the problems are with an expectation that we fix them. But if we ask more appreciative questions using models like appreciative inquiry, questions like, what do you love about this community already? Tell me a story about something that's good that's happened in this community. If we could build on all of those things that are good, in two or three years time, if money and resources were no object, what would this community look and feel like in respect of young people, homelessness, whatever it might be, whatever the subject of the inquiry is, uh, what would this community look and feel like if we could build upon everything that's good, if money and resources were no object? And I say that because actually we're going to find that money and resources doesn't really cost that much to do these things. And we do have the money. So they're going to describe it. We actually use techniques like rich picturing so we can get them to actually draw it um, that comes from a soft systems methodology of problem solving, so it's backed up by good old-fashioned research as to what works. And then the next set of questions are really important because once they've described that vision, the next set of questions are really easy ones for you as a police officer. So if that's your vision for the community, what first steps do you feel you need to take to get to that vision? What are the first steps you feel you, though, you need to take to start moving towards that vision? Then the next set of questions is, how can I support you? And this is where we can use methods like um, youth banks, um, participatory budgeting, uh, Detroit Soup. These are all sort of crowdfunding um, methods of raising money. Uh, also, you can act as a social, uh, the, the bridge in terms of social capital uh, theory or the, the bridge between uh, them as social capital and other forms of social capital, which is uh, money from the Policing and Crime Commissioner. You can help communities bid for that or you can bring the money to the community in terms of things like participatory budgeting. I've run several particip participatory budgeting pro programmes in the past. It's not just to get ideas off the ground, it helps bring people together. So you're connecting people in the community. You're bringing them together into your community group, into your commu working group. Eventually you want to let go of that community group. In a year or two, you'd be wanting to let go of it. You'd be wanting to cede the authority for that community group to members of the community. And eventually you want to step away from it. 
because the more you're there, the more they'll rely on you and the more they'll ask you for permission and the more they'll think that you're going to solve a lot of the problems. It's the nature of the questions you ask that are going to enable, enable that working group to grow and thrive. I'll offer another quote to you as well, uh, one from um, Sir, uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu, who passed away, sadly, um, was it a couple of years ago now. Um, one of his phrases uh, is that we must, um, we need to stop pulling people out of the water, uh, the, out of the river. We need to stop pulling people out of the river. We need to get upstream and find out why they're falling in. Now, that's the sort of response policing, pulling people out. Um, finding out why they're falling in in the first place, early intervention. I'm a huge fan of that, great big fan of early intervention. But I'm going to add to his uh, quote there. So we've got to stop pulling people out the river. We need to get upstream and, finding out why, and find out why they're falling in. And then at the same time, we need to find a path to the community, to the village, the town, the city, the metaphorical village, town or city that they're coming from. Because everyone who gets to the edge of the river to fall in, to jump in, has to come from a neighbourhood. So what if we could find that neighbourhood and when we get there, we can enable it to be the best version of itself it can be. We can enable it, enable it to grow and thrive and to increase its associational life, increase the number of associations in that community. So that the people within that community feel as though they are active citizens as opposed to the passive receivers of services from public servants. What if we could grow that community, enable that community to grow and thrive, so that the people who live within it never feel the urge to go to the river's edge in the first place? Wouldn't that sit nicely with what Sir Robert Peel said in 1829? The police are the public and the public are the police. The police just being members of the public who are paid full time to carry out a role which is incumbent on all citizens in the interest of community welfare and existence. Is what I've just described a community where there's a high level of welfare and existence? I think it is. It's not a new idea. It's from 1829. Perhaps we've just lost our way. Let me know what you think, folks. Join the Facebook groups for serving officers. Join the Facebook groups for people who want to join the police. Join the webinars where we can talk about how we can turn concepts like this and others into meaningful answers for your promotion boards. For how we can turn it into meaningful answers for your final interview and the situational questions we're going to get. And how we can turn it into meaningful, structured answers for your online assessment centres so you can score 90 plus percent. I hope you found this interesting, folks, a little bit longer than normal, but um, I passion, you probably tell I'm quite passionate about this style of policing. It's one that I employed as a neighbourhood inspector. Everyone scratched their heads thinking, what's he doing now? But it worked. It so worked. I'll catch up with you soon, folks. Bye-bye for now.